Hi, and welcome to the Mega FN Podcast. Uh, I'm Ed. And I'm Alan. And we're here with another top five for you. Today we're going to get a little personal. We're going to see the ABCs and me <laughs> and you. Yay. <laughs> um, we're going to do a top five of what we're calling our f- formative films. Mm-hmm. And what we mean by this is, I-, I meant it as kind of movies that help shape your taste in movies. These are by no means, I would never say, oh, this is the best movie of all time, and this is the best movie of all time. Yeah, it's the films that really represent the kind of movies that we personally like watching. Yeah, it influences your taste. Yeah. Um, You have a number five to start off with? Sure. Um, My number five formative film uh, is the kind of movie that I really enjoy. I really enjoy romantic comedies and musicals and oh you <laughs> and one of my favorites is from 1953 and it is the bandwagon uh mr Sweet. fred stair miss sid charisse uh it's the story of this group of performers that try to put on uh a show but yet but uh their director is like this really like high artsy fartsy pretentious kind of a person and he tries to mold the show into a different thing than what everyone else thought it would be it's a lot of fun the music is great the the dancing is terrific um the dancing between fred astaire and sid charisse is just awesome in that park and then there's that great extended sequence where uh, fred astaire dances as a gangster which influenced michael jackson when he made smooth criminal watch both and you'll see what i'm talking about <laughs> the bandwagon it's just it's just a lot of fun it's just one of those movies that you can watch over and over again and just have a good time sid Therese was like all legs too wasn't she it? was yeah <laughs> she was yowza cool see we're, we're getting to know we're, we're getting in the inside yes well my number five we're gonna get. I'm. I'm screwed. So my number five is a lot more frothy. Um, I, I chose airplane. Yeah. And the reason is, is because when I was young. Okay, first of all, for a long time in my my life, this may have been the most watched movie of my entire. I mean, I I kept a, I kept a, a running total once, and I got up to thirty something viewings, and then I I lost count. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, the, yeah, there's lots of great comedies, but this one, you know. The fact that there were so many rapid fire jokes. If you haven't seen Airplane, just go rent it. Just yeah, go, you know, watch it. It's funny. Um, um, you know, and it's it, it, in 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 my current brain. It, you know, I I'm able to make the linkage of like, oh, that style of humor was influenced by say the Marx Brothers. Oh yeah, from a long time ago. Sure. Or you know, and and how it influenced it's influenced de- generations after it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but my God, you know, between. Uh, Auto the autopilot and Leo's getting larger. I, I I can't tell you how much how many times I've thought back on that movie over the years. It's yeah, it's it's awesome. I mean, what else can you say? It's one of those great like later day uh, screwball comedies. Um, I mean, wasn't like Kareem Abdul Jabbar in that oh, movie? Yeah. And then there's that um, that old lady was talking to those uh, two pimps, and she's like, "What's up, man? What's going on?" You know. Uh, excuse me, Miss. I speak jive. That's yeah, that, yeah. I speak that, jive. that was That's Mrs. It. Cleaver from Leave It to Beaver. Right, right. Yeah. And it's just crazy. It's out of this world, but it's awesome because of it. Yeah. Moving on to my number four, Uh, my number four film uh, represents the kind of movie that I really like in the action genre. Uh, It's from 2010, and it is Takashi Miike's 13 Assassins. Um, I have not seen this one yet. Sort of a slight remake update of uh, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. It deals with these uh, 13 ronin who pretty much take it upon themselves to stop this cruel warlord from pretty much reigning the land with terror and brutality. And it's awesome because it's broken up into two different films. The first half of the movie is them pretty much plotting it out, kind of like a heist film. It's like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, you're going to do that, this is your job. And then the second half of the movie is nothing but absolute action. They trap like freaking 200 guys into this like town and it's pretty much just arrows and swords and they're just going at each other non-stop it's just awesome i can't recommend it more if you like samurai movies martial arts or just action films in general it is the movie to watch sweet yep well uh on to my number four um we're gonna stick in asia for mine um and that would be ikiru uh by ah, akira kurosawa yes uh, which I believe translated means to live. To live, yeah. Um, this is one of those movies that I still, I, I, I always think of as one of the most moving experiences I've ever had watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's the story of a a, a very uh, s- 
very low bureaucrat in the uh, in, in government who is going about his daily life and discovers that he is diagnosed with cancer mm-hmm. and the rest of the film is him just grappling with that reality that he's probably going to die mm-hmm. um, the movie also takes a, a hard about two thirds of the way in it takes a hard viewpoint shift away from the main character which is it's jarring and you think why but then you realize how brilliant that is as well mm-hmm. um also, I'm, I'm not going to ruin the ending, but it's got one of the most moving last sh- moments in a film ever. Mm-hmm. Um, the, that, that performance in Ikiru is fantastic. It's amazing how Kurosawa, who's so known with making these epic grand battles and samurai films can make something so personal and intimate it's just, and touching and moving yes it's incredible great movie great movie uh moving on to my number three uh kind of like airplane it's a comedy uh it's from 1936 and this film really represents my love for classic screwball comedies uh it is gregory lacava's my man godfrey uh the story of william powell mr godfrey who gets Picked up out of the streets by Irene, played by Carol Lombard, uh, for a contest, you know. You have these rich socialites who pretty much want to bring the best forgotten man. And what they don't realize is that Godfrey is actually a rich guy who lost it all. And he gets to see the world from a different viewpoint. And he enters uh, this family as a butler. And the family is off the wall crazy everyone in that movie is weird and nuts and just screwballs pretty much and godfrey really learns what it means to be in a position like that and it's funny it's romantic the dialogue in that movie is great um and the cinematography the black and white cinematography it's one of the most beautifully shot films of all time it's so worth watching if you guys haven't seen it can't beat william powell william powell is great Cool. Well, my number three is, I'm going to nominate it as my most obscure choice on this list. <laughs> and it's simply, this is just has everything to do with me personally. Um, and it is from 1982, I believe, and it's Tempest. Hmm. And it's um, it was directed by Paul Mazursky and starred uh, John Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins and Susan Sarandon and Molly Ringwald in her what? first film. And it is it was a modern retelling of Shakespeare's The Tempest, mm-hmm. set with like starts in New York and they end up on a Greek island. Raul Julia's in it as really yeah he plays the Caliban character from Shakespeare. The reason this movie made such an impact, I'm not even saying it's the best movie of all time, but it but I think it's a very interesting one, and it was I always think of it as the first adult movie I ever went to, and I don't mean like the first time I saw nudity or the first time I heard swearing, I mean I went. <laughs> I went to this by myself, and I must have been like 10 wow. or 11. Hmm. I have, I, to this day, I still have no idea why I went into the theater, <laughs> other than I had nothing to do, and it was in my local theater. Hmm. But I still sat there. I, I, I'm sure I didn't even know what was going on necessarily, but it made such an impact of just like, wow, these are adults talking about adult stuff. Mm-hmm. That's it, 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 weird. So it's it's a it's an obscure choice, but it's it's worth at least watching. <laughs> Little Ed grew up in those two hours, pretty much. <laughs> All right, let's move on to my number two. Um, my number two film is from two thousand and two, and before I saw this film, I always thought, you know, modern films are great, but really, is there much more that they can provide? When I saw City of God, I knew right then that yes modern films can provide something different, something fresh, something exciting, something I've never seen before. Uh, Fernando Morales, man, he knocked it out of the park with this film. If you haven't seen it, my God, what's wrong with you? Watch it right now. The story of the slums in Brazil and how these young kids just grew up, uh, told through the eyes of the main character, Rocket, and the other person who's on the other side of the fence in Lil Zay and how they have to deal with the drugs and the corruption and the violence and just living on the streets and it's told fantastically I mean the the time that this movie takes just whips by with its editing and its pacing Uh, just every shot in this movie just captures you and just keeps you riveted throughout the entire thing it's a fantastic movie 
Sweet. And I think you have a fan in Spencer. Yes, yeah, Spencer agrees. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my number two, um, going back to the Kurosawa well again, um, is Throne of Blood. Uh, and it's yes. because it was the very first Kurosawa movie I ever watched. I had a high school uh, drama teacher who gave me this videotape while we were studying Macbeth and said, watch this. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know. But I, it made it was a huge impact. Again, for you don't, those of you who don't know, Kurosawa made a few of these Shakespearean adaptations where he recast them in the samurai world. This was one um, where he re basically retells Macbeth but in the um, like Japanese no theatrical tradition. Mm. And it's got some beautiful cinematography. It was the first time in Macbeth I realized how the towards the end when the when the trees are coming towards the castle, mm -hmm. why that made sense. I, I always when I was reading the play, I'm like, there's trees coming towards the castle. Does anybody see those guys coming? And I'm like, oh, there's fog. And it, the way they staged it made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a beautiful film. I, it's one of the, it's gorgeously shot, and it opened my eyes to. I think foreign film is, was mm -hmm. where my my start with foreign film came from. I believe that has the the death scene at the end of that movie yeah. is spectacular. I think I watched the that scene like three times. Like, did they really shoot this guy with arrows? Yeah. It looks so freaking real. Yeah, that's that's an awesome pick. Uh, okay, moving on to my number one uh, formative film. It's from 1994, and this film really represents my the romantic in me. I'm a hopeless romantic, okay? And that is shown in Wong Kar Wai's Chunking Express. You don't get one romantic story, you get two. <laughs> <laughs> the first one deals with a cop who is trying to get over a girlfriend who dumped him and pretty much the grief that he feels and this sort of relationship case that he has with this mysterious woman who's wearing glasses and has a blonde wig and the story pretty much deals with how people connect uh, the second one um, is even better we have another cop played by Tony Leung who again is trying to deal with getting over relationship but he gets help quote unquote uh, from a woman by the name of Faye, played by Fei Wong, who helps him get over uh, his relationship by breaking into his house or breaking into his apartment and changing everything. I know it sounds a little weird, but somehow in the hands of Wong Kar Wai, he makes both stories work so perfectly well. It's sort of like a French New Wave film uh, with like pop 90s. Uh, stylings and everything like that. It's a hard movie to describe, but once you see it, you'll understand why I think it's so great. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Well, my number one, when I thought of this list, this was popped right to mind. Um, I love Melancholy, and I think the reason was because of this movie, The World According to Garp, mm. which um, is a, I'm sure the first time I watched it, it was because, oh, look, Mork's in a movie. But <laughs> <laughs> but ever since then, I, it, it's I've watched it countless numbers of times. Um, it's the, you know, the story of Garp, basically from birth to death, uh, and the characters he meets along the, on the way throughout a lifetime. Um, you know, jo uh, John Lithgow plays a, uh, a transsexual former football player. Uh, uh, his mom, played by Glenn Close, is a, a nurse who uh, took took his semen from a from one of her patients. Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy play his grandparents. Um, it's it's sad and melancholy and funny, and it was I, it's probably one of the first times where I realized oh you can have sad and funny all together. Mm -hmm. It's all mixed up. Um, I, it. It, it it's always it always comes to mind. Very cool. cool. Very cool. Uh, so uh, let us know uh, some of your top five, uh, you know, formative films. Let's share, people. Yeah, Let's share. It's, it's an open forum. <laughs> this was a quirky top five. Hope you hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Peace.